Oh, that's uh, well, congratulations, uh, you guys. Um, totally deserved, and what a fantastic Michael Russell oration uh, that will keep us going for another year. <laughs> well, um, tonight I have the honour of uh, handing out and announcing the Michael Russell Award recipient. The Michael Russell Award recognises champions who epitomise the spirit and commitment to solve what is one of the greatest challenges facing public health, how to help people stop smoking, and beyond individuals, how to help populations stop smoking. This year's recipient has over 40 years experience leading many studies and research centres, teaching and mentoring another generation who will continue the work, challenging at a national and international level the continued quest to improve upon what we thought we knew, to do better, to re-look at nicotine, tobacco and our outdated models and theories. I suspect he's learned how to clone himself and I have actually seen him attend two meetings at the very same time, quite recently. And uh, his CV extends to over 85 pages. He has over 300 publications and many awards. The people who nominated him, and thank you very much for doing so, noted that he is a trusted, brave thought leader. He is vocal and courageous, and we certainly need bravery and courage at this time, given the threats to tobacco harm reduction around the world. He is a force behind and supporting more people, groups, and organisations than I know, than you could possibly know. As a clinical psychologist, he learned by listening to his clients by reflecting on the efficacy of his counselling, that one solution, one approach, does not work for everyone. Like Michael Russell, tonight we celebrate and honour a mentor, a colleague, and a deeply compassionate human who is lending the full weight of his immense intellect and his influence to having tobacco harm reduction become a norm, in fact, a non-issue at all. The connection to Michael Russell goes deeper than a shared career focus, passion, service and leadership though. Our awardee is significantly to him also South African. It is my great honour to announce the recipient of the Michael Russell Award for 2019. It is Professor David Abrams. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, I want to just thank the committee and all the people who nominated me, and um, I'm very grateful and humbled. Um, my sense is that I do very little but try to enable others. Um, and the bottom line is um, something from New Zealand, um, he tang yata, he tang yata, he tang yata, which means it's about the people, the people, the people. And um, I now understand from Marawa and others that the nyang part, hmm? nah. the nya part, has a super spiritual meaning about the ethics. And I take that to go to the issue of human rights and social justice. And I think the talk Dr. Dworkin gave is very apropos of 
the essence of this. Um, it's about people who have the right to make decisions for themselves and how they manage the complexity of life. Some do it better than others. And who are we to judge? And if you truly listen to what people need and want, you would care about alternative nicotine products that are so dramatically safer that it's a tectonic shift that we haven't seen um, since people first started using tobacco and nicotine. And certainly, it's a disruptive technology that for the first time in about 120 years could literally replace and make moot the death and disease primarily caused by the invention of the cigarette rolling machine in the 1880s. This is the first true um, technology that could eliminate, and I believe will eliminate to the largest degree most of the long-term chronic heavy tobacco smoking that's responsible for the death and disease. But people do need to manage their lives and their stress in a non-stigmatized way. And um, I, I am actually quite angry and embarrassed and ashamed of my association with public health in the same way that I grew up in apartheid South Africa and just felt so horrible about being white and knowing what was happening in that country. Um, it's about the people, and uh, it's about human rights. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to have tried to tell the truth about nicotine and tobacco, and, and also the complexity that, that nicotine um, can actually be a very positive coping mechanism for the brain. And it's horrible that people have been brainwashed into thinking that even clean nicotine is an addictive behavior that ought to be eliminated and gotten rid of. There are so many smokers and probably vapors in this room that still think and hope someday, what's wrong with me? I still can't stop my nicotine. And I would say there's nothing wrong with you. You're learning as we all do, and I think alcohol, marijuana, and, and nicotine, especially in a safer form, are perfectly okay from time to time. So before I end, I, I have two anecdotes to tell. Um, one is, um, as a clinician in a hospital many, many years ago, and Ray Nayara was there um, in, in Providence, Rhode Island, I was called in to a consultation with a person who'd had a second MI heart attack, who was told to quit smoking the first heart attack and came back three years later with a second MI and had not been able to quit. And we did not have e-cigarettes then and NRT didn't work well for him. He tried everything. And it turns out that he was um, a fitter and turner on a lathe that worked for a aerospace company that may, and he had such an incredible skill of precision and accuracy in his psychomotor and concentration that he had been given a special room with a lathe because they only trusted him to make the fuel injection needles for the F-16 fighter under contract with the government which had to be at very minute tolerances that almost nobody else could achieve because there was still a human element to running the machine. And he basically said, I'd rather die at my lathe a two-pack-a-day smoker. I know all of why you know, I'm, I've had a second heart attack because I'm a patriot to this country because I've tried to stop smoking and I can't operate that machine at the level expected of me unless I have nicotine in my brain. And we actually know from neuroscience that that's accurate. Um, there are actually military studies in the 30s, 40s, and 50s that show nicotine improves attention, concentration, but also speed of information processing without errors. And it can give people in critical decision-making the edge to do it a little better. Um, and you could argue what's wrong with that if it doesn't kill you. 
So I, you know, I would say to all people that have switched from smoking to vaping, it's okay. Um, it probably won't kill you. There are safer and safer vaping products. And um, it's good enough if you need it to cope. Um, the stigma shouldn't be there. Uh, so I'll, I'll end with that. It's just very humbling to think it's about the people and how arrogant we all are to think we would know what somebody needs and wants without talking to them, listening to them, and seeing the unique humanity of why people do what they do by listening deeply and understanding where they're coming from before we make our arrogant public health and other uh, judgmental prescriptions and in so doing diminish ourselves and them and create the us versus them dichotomy that, that I'm ashamed to, to see what's happened in tobacco control. Uh, we are blowing the biggest opportunity to save lives that I've seen and that I think has occurred in, since, the, since the use of tobacco in any form and we're blowing it. We're absolutely ruining the opportunity to move people towards safer forms of recreational use of nicotine. Even the word recreational is a bad word that the tobacco control community doesn't want us to even utter. Um, that's just wrong. So thank you very much. I'm really honored. And I also want to thank all my colleagues over the years because the, the truth is I'm, I'm not as smart as they are, and they've guided me, um, particularly Ray and Ayara, and I, I won't name all the other people, but Ray and I have been colleagues and collaborators um, for almost the 40 years that I've been in this field, and we stimulate each other. Um, I wouldn't be perhaps so arrogant as to say we're kind of like Kahneman and Tversky, but, but I think we are in some ways for, for nicotine. And, and without the focus of, of uh, people at Penny Associates, Ray, and many, many others who I've worked with, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. I'm truly a, a team scientist. And I remember a, a quote, again, from my British background. Um, I think it was Sir Robert Hooke who invented the spring and the elasticity formula, and I think he said once, you, you may know this, um, but he said something to the effect, and I think he was thinking of Isaac Newton, but, but he was saying something like, in order to see a little further, one has to stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think that that's really part of this, is, is we're all part of humanity and we build on each other and, and do our little bit to make life a little more pleasant and to save lives from, from unnecessary death and disease where we can. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>